I'm Seth Ruffler, and we're at Tales from West, and we're revisiting history. Continue straight onto North Frank Lloyd Wright Boulevard. All right, so I am here at Tales from West by Frank Lloyd Wright. We're going to go check it out and see what, the, what it's in the store. He was a architect and uh, built a lot of places around the United States. Let's so look around as we're entering. Lots of pathways. It's very kind of utopian out here. It's freaking beautiful though. Is this the right way? It's official. Here's the Kinsanti bells. Welcome to Taliesin West. My name's Lori. I'll be your guide today. And on this tour, I want you to know you may take photos. Um, please keep your cameras out, though. You must take these photos as we go. You cannot go back on the property after the tour. So take photos and take them as we go. We still have to stick together as a group, though, so uh, don't wander off too far. Um, let's see. So that's the photos. Uh, questions, right? I'll do my best to answer any questions you may have. I get carried away with this, so I'll probably have to shout the questions out. <laughs> all right, and I'll do my best to answer them. But with that in mind, just a bit of an outline, all right? Really, really brief. One, I, I am really going to talk a lot about the art of architecture. I'll fill that in uh, with some uh, background information, some history as well. And toward the end of the tour, way, way toward the end of the tour, I'll try to explain what's going on here today. So that, that's kind of my game plan, all right? All right, so um, Frank Lloyd Wright. Everybody's heard the name? You know, I think when it comes to modern architecture, Frank Lloyd Wright is known in the United States as the father or grandfather of modern architecture. Oh, I believe if he were alive today and we asked him, he'd say, father of modern architecture in the world. Uh, I think we're getting a little flavor right there, yeah. You know, um, yeah, Wright was known for designing buildings where the indoors felt like the outdoors and vice versa. And here, Italios and West, he'll quite literally dissolve boundaries between inside and standing in the entrance court right now. Sky's your ceiling. You will be walking inside and outside by design. And with that in mind, I know you realize he never spent the summers here. This would be a winter home, winter studio, winter home for Wright's Fellowship. I don't know about you, but I find Frank Lloyd Wright to be bold and raw and you know he just doesn't coddle you at Tally S West in any way. He'll draw a response out of you here. Good or bad, he'll draw a response. Yeah. And maybe it's because it's later in his life. Uh, you know, he was born in 1867, Richland Center, Wisconsin, and died in Phoenix, 1959, at the age of 91. Yeah. So when he's buying property here, the first part of it, it was what, December 30th, 1937. He was 70 years old. So uh, this is later in his life, yeah. <laughs> and uh, maybe that's why, you know, but it's kind of a midst of a comeback for him as well at that time. So he's nowhere near retirement, okay? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and it, it is later in Wright's life. But yeah, Wright had been here before, just so you know, I think, uh, Consulting on the Biltmore Hotel is what brought him out here in 27. And there was a lot going on in Wright's life, mid to late 20s, but I, I think he fell in love with the desert. He made other trips out here, winters only, and starts buying this property in 37. Now, he buys the first 100 acres or so, then eventually you know, buys in pieces, but eventually owns and or leases up to 800 acres. The foundation still owns just under 500 today. All right, so, um, yeah, you know, when he comes here, he's not alone. I better let you know that. I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute, he has this crazy, melodramatic, uh, some say scandalous private life. I'm leaving all that on the internet and in the books <laughs> <laughs> Just enjoy it all there, all right? Check that out. At this point, he 
he is married to wife number three, Ogivana. She's the only Mrs. Wright who came here. They were still raising a daughter who was 12 years old in 1937. But do know, Wright raised a family at the very beginning of his career, even when he was starting out outside Chicago at Oak Park. Not only is he starting his architectural studio, but he, um, he's raising a family of six children with his first wife. Now that was the 1890s, early 1900s. That first family's grown up by the time Wright gets here. He's, he's a grandfather at this point as well. But picture him here with Ogivana, their daughter, and his apprentices. Yeah, Wright had apprentices. You see, he started a fellowship in 1932 and he started it at his first Taliesin. Wright built his first Taliesin, by the way, in 1911. Built it on the side of a hill, on the brow of the hill. Taliesin is a Welsh word. Here, the meaning taken to be shining brow, like the brow of your head. So um, he builds his home on the brow of the hill, so it would be, as he would say, of the hill, not on the hill. You should detect some philosophy in there because there is. You know his heritage now too. His mother's family immigrated from Wales to that area of Wisconsin. He always saw himself as a Welshman and people detect that in his work as well. Anyways, it's there in 32 he starts a fellowship which we could call educational but we'll just say there were no classes, no teaching, no degree under right. It's all learning by doing. They learned building construction, uh, rebuilding the buildings at Taliesin. They learned kitchen design, working in the kitchen, and they paid tuition to do it. Okay, Wright gets away with things like this. So you probably realize it is much more idealistic. They were running the farm up there. They'd be self-sufficient. Wright would bring in artists and residents, and not everyone would become an architect, someone into allied arts. Uh, they had a chorus, a string quartet. They staged performances, screen film. They have a printing press, and does all this go perfectly? Well, there's a lot of learning by doing that goes on in the operations of the fellowship. And by the time Wright gets here, he's got about 30 apprentices with him. They're pitching the tents in the desert, too. These nice pyramid-style canvas tents because they'll be camping out. Because they'll be learning by doing as they build the buildings here according to Wright's designs. Now, I've seen a nice perspective drawing, detail, you know, I've seen that. But I've never seen detailed construction drawings or specifications, so it's really a learning by doing endeavor, in the meantime, camping out. And I always think the question becomes, how could a camp be architecture? Well, you know, right, uh, I, write, I think he's already showing us. Wright wrote many things about architecture, and one of the things he wrote was that architecture is the art of creating spaces that express ideas. Okay. So constructed space is a big part of it, and ideas taking form, and I think one of the ideas is right over here. Property, well, I believe he was thrilled. He moves these into his architecture. These petroglyphs are about, what, 1,200 years old? They're real. They were created by the Hohokam, the first canal builders, first civilization, but that civilization's gone before Europeans get here. They left their artwork behind. There's probably more questions than answers when we look at these symbols, but for Frank Lloyd Wright, I believe a lot's going on. I mean, he seems to be marking the entrance court, letting you know you're inside. Pays respect to history. He's inspired, right? The symbol intersecting square spirals looks an awful lot like our Whirly Narrow logo. There are writers that, well, you know, there are people that actually see that symbol as being kind of an aerial view floor plan, if you will, of Taliesin West. And there are other writers that look at these, look at the buildings, and, and write about Taliesin West being perhaps a reconstructed ruin of a sort, or alluding to an archaeological dig site. And then I think what you find at Taliesin West, it is not just one thing. It is a fusion of ideas. Uh, uh, a collage of ideas, layers and layers of ideas. This gets you started. <laughs> now, before we go much further, you can see the steps right here. The dangers of office. Yeah. This is where he greeted all visitors, clients, potential clients, and anyone who came to see Frank Lloyd Wright, they came here. He could have plans out on the table, and they could do all the talking here and keep it quiet in the drafting studio, keep the apprentices working away over there. If you came to see Wright, now you know what he would have looked like. This is a 1949 photo, so he's 81, 82 years old. He's standing by the fireplace. He looks tall, 
He said he was five feet eight and a half inches tall. Many people, many people think he was shorter than that. But I know one thing: he he never ducked his head. <laughs> I mean, Bucky threw his six foot high entrances around here. Well, maybe we're learning a little bit about Wright's public image in this photo, which, which I believe he's crafts. He crafts, right? I mean, he's had himself photographed in such a way that he he looks larger than life. There's a lot of showmanship and bravado with Frank Lloyd Wright. His name is still one of the most recognized in the world today. He even kind of dresses the part of architect, as he saw fit. You know, he's, he's wearing his tailored tweed suits, uh, pork pie hats he's known for, and he costumes himself in such a way to maybe stand out from the other architects. I mean, so we need a little flavor of that here. But if we're learning about Wright's public image in this photo, we're learning a lot about the interiors at Taliesin West. And when you look up, you, you see canvases. In the beginning, many of the buildings here uh, canvas-topped, like tents. He would have canvases framed in redwood, supported in redwood, no glass to begin with. We've got a picture of canvas shutters, or framed canvases canvas for the door, tent tops, right? So light, there are writers that would say the rooftops at Taliesin West, maybe they'd blow away, and if they did, maybe it would be an actual ruin. You know, I really don't think the walls are going anywhere. <laughs> but yeah, uh, he could have the end shutters propped open, or pulled open with a pulley system. He wrote in his autobiography about the breezes blowing through the buildings at Taliesin West. He, he wrote about the birds flying through the buildings at Taliesin West. Okay, is this too much? I mean, this is back in the day when, uh, you know, there's a lot of hand drawing, drafting, tracing. He's got plans on the table, and, you know, birds can be messy. And, um, wow, does he push us just too far with that? Or is he daring us, daring us perhaps to see architecture as something more than building construction? Yeah. Well, some of you know he called this architecture organic. Okay. He starts using the term in the 1890s. Mm. Oh, it's a different world. Never gives you a nice, clear, concise definition on that organic either. Maybe he'd rather we just study his buildings to see what he means. When he does write about it, and he writes a lot and speaks a lot about it, it gets rather, um, oh, his writing gets a little discursive and even contradictory. But then again, that messiness, Hmm, kind of like life itself. So I guess we might see Wright's uh, organic as tying right back to life itself and all of its, uh, all of its grandeur, beauty, and messiness. Yeah, you know, but we, we kind of end up putting words in his mouth anyways when we talk organic with Wright. And I, I guess I'm no different. You know, he's known for abstracting nature forms into his designs abstracting distant landscapes, some would say abstracting the client's needs into the architecture, needs as Frank Lloyd Wright saw them. Mm -hmm. Huh, what kind of needs would those be that we don't even recognize ourselves? Well, we could say, uh, you know, he wrote about a poetry of space. He called that organic. Did we know we needed that? Hmm. More we're around here, we might. How about uh, um, human dignity? He saw that as important. He saw democracy as organic. And I guess at Taliesin and West, I'll just say that if he thought nature should be your, part of your life with animals coming in and out, well, you know, I think you're just not going to ignore it here. So I guess, I'll, I guess that's my case for the broadness of rights organic, and I believe he makes that term his own. Okay, so super light rooftops, places them on desert rubble masonry walls. He's got his apprentices, hires a little local labor, they build wooden forms or molds. They're walking and grading the property, right? and as they go, they're, they're collecting these nice flat-sided, fractured slab-like, narrow pieces of quartz, right? And uh, putting uh, those pieces into the form or colored side out, mixing up a thick batch of concrete from the sand and gravel on site, and shoveling it in and around these pieces of stone within the formwork. You know, build the wall up so high, uh, let the concrete cure, move a couple boards up, add more boards, build more wall, you know, repeat as necessary, and you know, this is how they're building the walls at Taliesin West. And this is known as a slip form method of construction, and probably the easiest way you could build a stone wall. Which invites a lot of comments. Thing is, 
This is Frank Lloyd Wright. I have to believe these walls are intentional, that they're exactly what he wants. It invites a closer look. Uh, we look closer at these walls, things stand out. I mean, one, he's not covering them up. He wants us to see these materials. He has to. He kind of celebrates the materials he's working with. Draws the beauty out of the desert floor that we're walking on, perhaps. And, um, yeah, maybe a desert mosaic we're looking at. Um, thing Wright's doing spring to summer of 38 drilling a well and that is our source of water to this day it's well water wells about 500 feet deep located by the solar panels you drove in by and I like to say water is important in the desert uh, so important some say Wright spent more money drilling the well than he did purchasing the property uh, power would be in the form of a generator to begin with power would come from off-site in 51 it's going to stay warm, and as you notice on the office and other buildings, the, the rooftops look to the south or southwest. He's absorbing a lot of radiant heat. The building's built for this time of year. It's very nice and toasty. But as soon as the sun goes down, there's going to be fireplaces for right. You saw one in there. You'll see about eight more as we go along. Now, Wright loves the fireplace. He's known for anchoring rooms in his designs with fireplaces. It's, it's a heart and home, right? But yeah, it would be his only heat source, fireplace. And they, yeah, they purchased firewood. And yeah, you probably have to pull the chair up to the fire to stay warm. But at this point, you start to realize that, you know, for Wright, it's not just that physical comfort, is it? For Wright, he's looking at beauty of the fire, romance of the fire, gathering around the fire. And at this point, you start to see, he makes you think about how you balance aesthetics against comfort. We do it all the time. He just draws our attention to it. But yeah, other than these things, he's got, you know, pickup truck, flatbed truck, material screens, concrete mixer, pickaxes, chocolate and wheelbarrow. Oh, that's pretty much a dozen. Yeah. But by now, well, maybe you'll agree with me. Best camp I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> There's the building we were just in. The fountain, there's some more petroglyphs kind of scattered and built in here. Same walls. So gorgeous. Gorgeous. Shangri-La. I'm gonna build one of these. She 
just said, it's like, right, becomes part of you. So this is Frank Lloyd Wright's piano right here, inside of his his uh, studio where that he'd be working at. See the different architecture; in it. it's been beautiful. Let's light in. This is how you get to Wonderland through the door. I'm just kidding. It's super cool though. This has changed over the years, of course. This is to the mid 50s, so apparently it looked like this. Even though I know I haven't, I've seen an undated photo of a full size double bed in this location. So, but apparently it's like this in the mid 50s, and we seem to be left with the story. Okay, true part of the story is that Wright was a catnap or sleeper who liked to work at night. So he'd sleep, wake up, work, go back to sleep, wake up, work, and that's a sleep habit. The story part, unconfirmed story part of the bed, is that if Wright did not want to be disturbed while sleeping, apparently he slept on the far side of the bed. And if you were the apprentice assigned to clean the room, you were told to look through the window. If you're sleeping over there, you waited outside. If you were on this side of the bed or at the desk, well, then you come in and get the work done. That's the story on the bed. For me, though, I find it pretty fascinating. You know, if you stand over there on the far side of the bed, I, I really think you get the idea of what a, a Usonian home bed stall could be like. He would design small Usonians, bedrooms of about that size, made the room seem larger with the floor-to-ceiling window, and it, it's got a nice kind of playful effect and sheltering effect, you know, looking out to the world. Around behind the fireplace, um, take a look in there, bathroom, the only one that was restored along the way. They restored it because right So they could fit everyone in here in the early years. Different furniture, right? We get the generator going. They put projectors up there, screen film on the screen behind me, and they're watching movies out here. But they'd outgrow this as well. And by the end of 1950, right at another movie theater, place the cabaret. So that's our final building on the tour road. Over the years, this room's been used for many things. It's now used as a, uh, a meeting room. And I don't think either of the right saw the round table in here. Um, there are two groups that use this for meetings. The first one I'll talk about is the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation. 
a first a reminder, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright's personality, you know, at this point we know he's a convincing man. He could convince those wealthy clients to get his buildings built. Buildings that seem impossible to build at times. He gets them built and, and changes our perspective on architecture at the same time. Um, but when it comes to money, he uses this convincingness in another way. I mean, Wright's kind of a wheeler and dealer. Seemed to like to live on the financial edge. And he's notorious. He's known for charging up supplies, groceries, um, and going off buying more artwork or a fancy car. He doesn't always pay his bills. I just had someone yesterday from Ridgeland Center, Wisconsin, saying, you know he didn't pay all his bills, you know, so um, yeah, he, he somehow convinced those suppliers to charge more things even if he hadn't paid them. And, uh, you know, he'd borrow money, go off and buy another luxury, never pay back the loan, and, and people like Darwin Martin would loan him more. I don't know how he looks like this, but he's able to for most of his life, but it catches up with him. In 1940, he establishes the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation to protect his assets from creditors. And those assets would include um, Taliesin in Wisconsin, Taliesin West in Arizona, and his architectural work. And uh, so now you can see when he dies in 59, the family does not inherit. It goes to the foundation, of course. Uh, Ogivana, she becomes president of the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation. <laughs> you have to realize, when the Wrights were alive, board members were their friends. They, they lived their same old ways, but when she died in 85, things would change. Today, the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation is a standard nonprofit. Um, mission quite different, I would say. Now the mission is to preserve and protect the buildings here and at Taliesin in Wisconsin and oversee the archives now housed in New York City, keep the buildings open to the public and so on. Foundation offices are here, they use this room for meetings. The other group that uses this is the School of Architecture at Taliesin. Interestingly, Wright's um, fellowship would become accredited in the 1980s as a small capacity, roughly 30 student, private architectural school granting a degree, a degree, right? I think shocked, right, would be shocked by that, but a, granting a master's in architecture. Um, and uh, today, or recently, I'll just say uh, that the school board, though, has announced that they're closing the school at the end of June of this year. And it looks like another big transition ahead. Um, I, I don't really know what to say about it, except that uh, professional education will look quite different out here after the end of June. But I guess I will just say for right now, you know, this is difficult, sad. I certainly do not have all the details. It's very complicated from what I can see. Uh, but for now, for all of us today, the school is in residence here. They're finishing the semester here, and they're not backing down, right? They're using this room in the evenings for meetings. Uh, they're in residence typically here anyways, October through the, about the 10th of May, right? So they're here. And they bring the buildings back to life. And you may see someone in the dining room. You'll see their computers in the old drafting studio. Oh, you know they're inspired to be in Wright's drafting studio. And, uh, and they're still camping out to the north of the property. The desert camp lives on. They have over 25 shelters. They restore, remodel, build their own <coughs> shelters. Uh, someone's always trying out a tent. And um, I'd love to tell you that in May they'd be packing it up and heading to Taliesin in Wisconsin for the summer, but I can't say that. And so um, this may be this may be it, and maybe the last uh, of uh, of that of that history. And only time will tell. We'll see you at the end of June. Um, I think I'll leave it at there, but we will head back outside again. This is gorgeous from the pavilion. Or you like to see a little model at the top? Thank you. Oh, wow. It's a
like this for the public, but instead use this space for a guest lecture series and of course the, those fun times of midterms, finals, and critiques happen in here as well. Uh, today the foundation has made the choice to keep the theater spirit alive, bringing in theater groups, music groups, and uh, they also rent this out for events. But uh, keeping the room used for the reasons it was built is the idea. Even now, though, we see a lot of Frank Lloyd Wright. We, we know his favorite color. This is one variation of the Cherokee Wright <coughs> he loved, and you'll see variations on that. And I saw a rather nice depth to the stage. <coughs> there are two sets of uh, curtains that are like gates. They kind of swing back and forth, and those are unusual. Wright's not hiding anything. We can see the exposed stage lighting. You are seated on a natural slope that's been terraced for the chairs. It seats 108 people in here. It's a nice intimate theater. I think the biggest question that comes up is the archway. Until this archway was once part of a stage setting, but was left in place because it is a <coughs> quarter scale copy of Frank Lloyd Wright's City by the Sea mural from his 1914 Midway Gardens Project Chicago. Since it's a copy of Wright's work, well, they left it in place. So uh, that's the story of the auditorium. We do have a small <coughs> building to see. It is our cabaret theater. So uh, we're going to head back down the sidewalk. We'll lead to the right of the fountain at the bottom of the stairs. Wow. So this is an exaggerated example. 
helpful, but it's the idea behind the stage. Yeah, let's use it for the cabaret. We've walked the historic core of Pally SMS. You've seen the place where Frank Lloyd Wright was at, where he lived with his uh, fellowship, where he brought his clients and visitors and brought them into his world. We've been in the world of Frank Lloyd Wright, too. I mean, you can't ignore it, the way he has you walking up and down changing your perspective around every corner and finding doors and discover spaces, discovering the spaces behind them. And, and by the time you leave Tally SMS, you seem to take a little bit of it with you. Frank Lloyd Wright said, no man owns an idea, but by using an idea, he gives it to the world. And I think we all leave Tally SMS to having caught a bit of that creative spark. Before we leave, um, uh, I want to thank you for taking the tour. Tour to Good Sales are the biggest fundraiser we have to keep the building standing here and in Dallas and in Wisconsin. Thank you for coming. If you'd like to help out further, we have a membership program, some coupons. I'm Seth Ruffler, and we're at Tailson West, and we're revisiting history.